Psychedelic drugs are a class of substances that interact with the serotonin receptors in the brain, causing an alteration in perception, and sometimes resulting in visionary or hallucinatory experiences. The most commonly used psychedelic drugs are LSD, DMT, mescaline, and psilocybin mushrooms. While the use of these drugs may seem a little taboo in our society, these substances are glorified in spiritual movements such as shamanism or the New Age movement, and they are advertised as being gateways to supernatural realities and catalysts for metaphysical insight. They have been used for such purposes for thousands of years. Since coming out of the New Age movement, one of the most common questions I have received is what does the Bible say about psychedelics? Is it a sin to use them? As someone who has had some experiences with psilocybin mushrooms, has seen documentaries explaining the spiritual benefits of these substances, and used to watch Terence McKenna videos frequently and read his work, The Food of the Gods, I do bring a little bit of experience and background understanding to this video. In another video, we will look more into the spiritual dangers of psychedelics and the strong delusion that comes along with them, but in this video, we're going to focus on how the use of psychedelics is condemned in the Bible, and how we are to understand them in light of Christ all of the scripture and arguments we are going to look at also apply to the use of other drugs such as marijuana, meth, or cocaine. We should start off by establishing that the meaning of life is fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, not expanding our perspectives, being in contact with the spirit world, or fulfilling human curiosity. The end of human life is to be restored to relationship with the Father through faith in Jesus. It all comes down to salvation available in Christ alone, which by itself is the entire purpose of our life here. If it is not bringing you to your knees at the feet of the Savior in conviction over your sin and his lordship, it won't matter in the end because eternity lies on the other side of the veil. And when we stand before God, we are either covered by the blood of Jesus or we are guilty under the weight of our sin. Biblically speaking, the shifting of our consciousness with drugs is not something God calls us to do. It does not bring us closer to him. And as we are about to see, it is something that directly conflicts with the commands given in scripture. Now the Bible actually prohibits the use of drugs under the word sorcery. In Galatians 5 it reads, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, etc. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here it says that those who partake in sorcery will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Greek word used here is actually pharmakia, which is where we derive the word pharmacy from. While it's true that this word means magic and witchcraft, it also means magic with drugs, or simply, the use of drugs. The use of drugs, especially of purgatives. Generally, the use of any kind of drugs. The use of magic often involving drugs, and the casting of spells upon people. In its general sense, practice of drugging. The use of drugs. Sorcery. The preparing or using of medicine. Then, the using of any kind of drugs, potions, or spells. The use of medicine, drugs, or spells. The use or administering of drugs. Psychedelics fit this definition perfectly. Now since we know the Bible does not prohibit the use of medicine, as even Luke, the author of Luke's Gospel and Acts, was a practicing physician, we can conclude that this word includes drugs used for recreational, spiritual, or ceremonial purposes. Potential extra-biblical support for the word pharmakia being the use of drugs, and even perhaps psychedelics in particular, comes from the Book of Enoch. While the book of Enoch is not God-breathed like scripture is, that doesn't mean it doesn't contain any truth. After all, Jude quoted from the book of Enoch directly, meaning at least some of it is true. Now this is not the word of God, it's not scripture, but it does give us insight into potential truth, as well as a historical understanding of how the Jews and early Christians may have understood the use of such substances. When describing the fall of angels and the knowledge they taught to mankind to pervert the human race, it reads, And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and then began to go in unto them and defiled themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with the plants. The Hebrew word used for charms is kishaf, meaning sorcery and or witchcraft. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word used here is pharmakia. Notice here how kishaf, pharmakia, the cutting of roots, and the knowledge of plants are being taught alongside one another, as if they are all a part of the same office. Again, in chapter 8, we see that one fallen angel named Semjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Why did the fallen angels insist on teaching mankind how to cut roots and make them acquainted with the plants? Since Adam already knew everything there was to know about gardening before the fall, man was already acquainted with the plants in the context of horticulture. So this is not a fallen angel trying to teach humanity how to be better gardeners. While this may refer to roots being used in spellcasting, a 
possible explanation for this reference is that the fallen angels taught mankind how to identify and utilize the psychedelic compounds found within the root systems of plants in order to trigger visionary experiences. Some roots, such as the iboga root, have been cultivated and used by shamans in mixtures and brews for thousands of years because they contain psychedelic compounds that, when extracted and consumed, give people supernatural metaphysical experiences. Here is a list of over 20 plants with psychedelic compounds in their roots. This would explain the reference to root cutting and being made acquainted with the plants and why it is taught alongside enchantments and pharmacia. Looking at all this, someone might say pharmacia in Galatians and Enoch is not referring to drugs, but to spell casting. Sure, the word can mean the use of drugs, but that's not what the Holy Spirit had in mind in Galatians and in other parts of the Bible. If transpersonal mystical experiences coming alongside the use of drugs cannot be called pharmacia, I don't know what can. This is literally what the word means in its primary usages. But even if we turn a blind eye to the definition of pharmacia and say this means performing witchcraft only, here are four other ways that God condemns the use of such substances in scripture. The use of psychedelics falls under the same category as drunkenness. The Bible says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. As we already read in Galatians, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The word used here for drunkenness is methe, and it primarily refers to intoxication by alcohol. However, it is not limited to this and also includes intoxication by other substances. According to the New Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, methe means an intoxicant, intoxication, drunkenness. So the Greek word here refers to any kind of intoxicant. We are not to be drunk with wine or any substance. This is what methe means. And the word drunk means relating to, caused by, or characterized by intoxication pertaining to or caused by intoxication or intoxicated persons. So even the English word drunkenness does not refer to alcohol alone, but to any kind of intoxication. And intoxicate means to excite or stupefy by alcohol or a drug, especially to the point where physical and mental control is markedly diminished. So the word drunkenness doesn't just refer to alcohol, and the word methe doesn't just refer to alcohol. It's the Greek word used to indicate any kind of intoxicant. So if the Bible says that intoxication is a serious sin that will exclude someone from the kingdom of heaven, and the very way psychedelics function is to intoxicate one's brain and bloodstream with psychoactive chemicals, then using them is a sin that transgresses God's commandment to refrain from methe, from drunkenness, which again does not refer to alcohol only, but to any kind of intoxication by drugs. Another point is that we are directly commanded to be sober. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. As for you, always be sober-minded. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The Greek word used here is nepho, which means to be temperate, self-controlled, and abstinent. These are direct commands in scripture for us to be sober, especially in our minds and in our thinking. And we can't be sober in our minds and in our thinking if we are intoxicated under chemically induced states of consciousness. A fourth way the Bible prohibits the use of psychedelics is that we are called to come separate from the secular and pagan world. God wants us to live in a way that is pure and distinct from the ways of this world. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. 
but that is not the way you learned in Christ. We are commanded to cease from the actions that the world partakes in and to live a life that is set apart for God. This is why God gave commandments in the Old Testament to the Jews, telling them how to dress, how to wear their hair, and not to make markings on their skin. It says in Leviticus, they shall not make bald patches on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts on their body. Other cultures would do these things as part of their religious practices, and God didn't want his people to be associated with the idolatrous ways of the pagan nations. From the very beginning, God commanded his people to have nothing to do with the spiritual practices of the surrounding nations. God wants a people for himself that is virginal, pure, and conformed to the image of his son. He wants us to look different, think different, and act different. And historically speaking, the only cultures who used these substances were pagan. Siberia, ancient Egypt, Asia, Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, China, ancient Greece, India, Peru, Maya, and other Mesoamerican cultures, Native America, all these cultures have been using psychoactive drugs for thousands of years for spiritual, recreational, and ceremonial purposes. God is telling us to come out from the way these cultures think and act, especially in regards to their spirituality. Biblically speaking, the only historical precedence we have for the use of psychedelic drugs comes from the pagan nations that God commands that we be distinct from. And a fifth point we're going to look at is that we are called to obey the laws of the land. God wants us to live lives that are above reproach and in accordance with the laws that the government has put in place. In so doing, we glorify God and keep our conscience clean. So let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Speaking to Titus, Paul says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. It dishonors God when we live our lives in a way that makes us blamable under the law, and so using drugs transgresses God's commandment to live lawful, obedient lives. Obviously, if the law commands we do things that contradict his commandments, then we are to obey God instead. But apart from laws demanding that we sin against God, we are to follow the laws of the land. And for the vast majority of the people watching, these drugs are illegal in their country and state. And for those who want to say, well, these drugs are legal in my country and state, all the other points we looked at would still apply. We can clearly see the Bible communicates a variety of different principles that put the use of psychedelics in a class of very serious sin, going as far as to say that drunkenness, or methe, intoxication, and sorcery, pharmakia, the use of drugs, will exempt the person from the kingdom of God. It causes us to be intoxicated in our bodies and minds, it conforms us to the pattern of the pagan and secular world around us, and it is against the law which God commands that we follow in order to honor him. And so we need to turn away from our sins, put away the use of these substances, put our faith in Jesus for our salvation, and follow the straight and narrow path that leads to everlasting life.